Imagine that you're a technology sales executive. One day, as you come home to your condo, you pick up the mail, and there it is, a jury summons. You've lived in Dallas for 30 years, and you've been called a few times before, but have never been selected. You defer the summons, twice. Whoever has time for jury duty. But finally, you call into work, and you head to the courthouse, pass through the metal detector, and head into the giant room where they hold the prospective jurors. Well, we were funded off to a court, and there was about uh, 200 of us uh, filling out a jury survey. And if you'd heard of this case, well, I hadn't heard anything about it. Um, answered the questionnaire, um, and then we took a break. Two days later, I show up, and they, uh, they call us in order, and I'm on the first row in Vordire. And I've been, I've, I've been to enough, to, enough Vordires to know that if you're on the first couple of rows, that there's a high, high chance, likelihood they're looking at you to serve. That's a man named Terry. He sat there, worried about the time commitment, since they were predicting the trial would take five or six weeks. As they listed the jurors, he heard his name called out. He had just been selected for the trial of Dr. Christopher Dunch. From Wondery, I'm Laura Beale, and this is Dr. Death. This is episode nine, One Great Man. From time to time, I'll have updates on the case of Christopher Dunch, either as new events occur or as I find new stories to tell. You might remember this lady. Dr. Dunch is one great man. He is the best doctor, I think, that anybody could ever go to. And if you're having the problems that I had, you know, give him a call because he'll fix you. The voice from the infomercial that Dunch patient Jeff Glidewell would watch online, the one that would help convince him to choose Dr. Dunch as his surgeon. The Chiron on the screen only identified the patient as Pam, nothing more. I wasn't able to find out anything about the woman in the video. At first I thought she must be the one patient who actually did have a positive experience in surgery with Dunch early in his Dallas career and that's why she agreed to be in the video. Later, I figured she must have been a paid actor. Neither of those turned out to be true. Lori Watley lives in Trenton, Texas, a tiny town about an hour north of Dallas. She's not the woman in the video. But in September of 2018, she was preparing to take a flight and needed something to help pass the time on the plane. So I immediately went and downloaded the podcast, and I thought, oh, I'll you know, start episode one now while I'm waiting on my husband to get off work to pick him up to go to the airport. And got about 90 seconds in, and of course, you know, the very beginning of episode one is, Dr. Dunch is one great man. And there's my mom's voice, you know, haunting us all. I hear it, and it just, my stomach dropped. I mean, literally, my stomach dropped, and I just thought, Oh man, I can't believe that this is, you know, back to haunt us again. And anybody. Lori immediately found an email address for Wendry and fired off a message. I'm not even three minutes into episode one of Dr. Death, and I've already heard my mother. My mother is the patient on Best Docs. Lori's mother is Pam. Pam Trusty, which seems like a fitting name for her and pretty much any patient of Dr. Dunch. Pam lives in the same Texas town as her daughter. They started probably a year before I ever met Dr. Dunch. I was having shots put in my neck and down my arm and everywhere. And I was getting those about every three weeks and nothing was getting any better. Her pain doctor referred her to a rheumatologist. He said she needs to have surgery because she's got a pinched nerve. And we've got a great surgeon down here in Dallas I wanted her to see, and it's Dr. Christopher Dunch. This was in October of 2012, after Dr. Dunch had already had a string of bad results, including two deaths. 
She didn't know that, of course. She liked him. Well, the first time that I met him, he had the MRIs, and he was showing them to me, and he said, right here's where your pinched nerve is, and we'll go in, and we'll relieve the pressure on that, and I'll do a fusion. He told me that he had never had a do-over, that he had football players that were back on the field within six months, and he was very convincing. Now, I feel like a hill. I mean, I really feel low. That's Pam's husband, Larry. Whenever we left that doctor's office and I got to where I could, I started researching him in hospitals, and I could not find nothing. I told my son, I said, there's something wrong with that man. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know, but there's something wrong with him. And he said, do you think it's bad? I said, I don't know, Max. That's my son's name. I said, I don't know. I said, but there's something wrong. And I said, your mama has made her mind up that that's who she wants to do her surgery. And I said, I hate to put doubt in her mind because she's got to have confidence in a doctor that's fixing to cut on you, but there's something wrong with him. But but I don't know what, and I can't find out And what anything. was it? What was it that gave you this bad feeling? Whenever we got there and in the waiting room, there was nobody, just me and my wife. Pam had her surgery in December of 2012. Dunch had led the trustees to believe that her operation would be at Baylor Plano, even though he was long gone from there. But it ended up taking place at University General in the southern part of Dallas. The surgery took longer than anticipated. When she woke up in the recovery room, her shoulder was in excruciating pain, unable to bear even the slightest touch. He said, well, I must have taped you down too tight. And I said, okay, so what's going to happen with it? He said, oh, it'll get better. He said, it's just your muscle, you know, spasm or something. The pain was still there three weeks later when she went back for her follow-up visit. Her shoulder and her neck were both hurting. Before the visit, her daughter Lori noticed something odd. Within her scar, there was something blue coming out of her scar. Her stitches were black. Like what color blue? Like royal blue. So wait a minute, there's something royal blue coming out of her Coming scar. out of her scar. And I got a pair of tweezers and I pulled it and pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled out of this scar because it was open, just a small, maybe quarter of an inch, the scar was open. And that thing was probably two or three inches long, whatever was it was. It? According to Dunch, it was a stitch. It was an internal stitch that was coming out, according to him. I don't think so. I think it was what did a it look like? piece of something. It looked like sponge material to me. Like, I think it was a piece of sponge. Now that we know everything that we know, I think it could have possibly been a piece of sponge. Dr. Dunch didn't seem all that concerned about the whatever it was. He was eager to talk about something else. He then proceeds to tell me that he had been awarded the best doctor in Dallas and that his staff, which there was two or three people there, had picked me to do a video shot because they liked me and they just thought I'd do great. Well, of course, you get excited because you think, oh, I'm going to do a video spot and, and all this stuff, you know. And at that point, I still knew nothing, you know, that, that was wrong. And I'm thinking, how is she so successful when she's still in a lot of pain, you know? But I didn't think anything about it. And it's true that it's pretty normal for pain to linger after a surgery. So my daughter drove me down there because at the time I couldn't drive still. I was one day shy of being seven weeks out, but I'd never seen him again. On the day of the shoot, she brought photos with her. They had asked for action shots. One walking with her granddaughter, one from the Texas State Fair. 
Then someone from the production sat her down in front of a green screen. And she said, now you use Dr. Dunch's name every chance you get. And you're talking, said, just make sure you put him out there where everybody knows who you're talking about. And did they tell you what to say or did they ask you questions? They just said, uh, you know, you need to talk about how good he is and what an excellent outcome you've had. And, you know, so they pretty well was telling me. From the time that we walked into that building, it was not an infomercial. It was an award. He was chosen. It wasn't paid for. That's the words of best doc. She signed a release form. They were in and out of the studio in less than an hour. And it aired on February 17th, okay. 2013 on Channel 21. They recorded the infomercial when it aired. Meanwhile, Pam kept scheduling follow-up appointments to see Dr. Dunch, but his office kept rescheduling them. The pain wasn't getting any better. This went on month after month. Finally, Pam had an appointment set for late June of 2013. She was on her way to the office when she got a call. It was Dunch's office saying they had to cancel today's appointment and that he wouldn't be able to see any patients until at least October. No reason. No reason. Just, I mean, she asked, is he okay? And yeah, he's okay. You know, he's just going to have to take some, he's having to take some time off. And I'll say. <laughs> yeah, right? And so the way we even found out was later that night watching the news. Patients showing up to his Plano office, trying to get records. They learned from the news that suspended. on that same day, Christopher Dunch's medical license was temporarily suspended. I cried. And uh, especially when I found out about the patients that he had killed and the ones he had maimed. And worse than you. Yeah, my, maimed worse than me, like the ones that couldn't walk, his best friend. And I, I cried, and then I thought, thank God he was with me, God was, because I could have been any of those. And that's what rushed into my thoughts. She eventually ended up in the office of another neurosurgeon who told her that Dunch had inserted the wrong screws in her neck and likely torn the rotator cuff in her shoulder during the operation. He also said the nerve damage and the pain will likely never go away. So that doctor that he's talking about, when I told him that Dr. Dunch had operated on me, he just come unglued. I mean, he said, I can't believe that. He said, how did you get to him? And I told him about this other doctor sending me. And he said, he knew better. He knew better. We all knew better in Dallas. All of us doctors he said, knew. Are you and this sure? was a neurosurgeon. And he said, you're sure that Dr. So-and-so sent you to him? I said, yes. He said, we all knew that. He knew it. So, so I don't. why would he have referred you there? That's, that was our question. That was our question, and that was the doctor. Have you ever got an answer to that question? No, no, no. no. Right. He said that he had several of Dunch's patients, but he could not believe the doctor that referred her to Dunch. The doctors you see on today's show, you head to the website, and that would be Candace. Bestdocsnetwork.com. That's the place. That is the place to go. Now the, place the video stayed online. It remained up even after D Magazine dubbed him Dr. Death. Even after local news reports kept chronicling the story in ever more disturbing detail. It stayed up through his trial where anyone could Google it and pull it up on YouTube. Pam tried to get the company to take it down, but they never responded to her. It really hurt me that I couldn't get it off the air. The only thing about that video still being out there is the fact that it might be there, but he's not. So it won't hurt anybody else, but it makes me feel so angry when I hear me say the words, Dr. Dunch is one good doctor. I asked her what she would say if she were to make that same video today. Today, I would say, I've been told that Dr. Christopher Dunch uh, was awarded the best docs in Dallas award, don't go to him. <laughs> you know, he is a murderer and he is a crippler. And whatever you do, never, 
call that office. Pam only learned from listening to this series that Jeff Glidewell, who would be Dr. Dench's final patient, had seen the video online and that it helped persuade him to go to Dunch. I feel like I was used and it really made me mad because the little girl in the office, when she was smiling at me, you know, after he said that uh, I had been selected by his office staff, I thought, yeah, I was selected by his office staff because I was one of the few that was up and walking around. Right. And if you could talk to Jeff Glidewell, what would you say? I would tell him, I am so sorry. I mean, it breaks my heart to think that anybody went to him because of that video, and especially what he went through. The video finally came down in October 2018, shortly after the release of this series. The parent company has not responded to my emails and the phone number they publicize isn't a working number. When I drove to the last address they had listed, their sign was still out front, but a totally different business was at that location. You spend a third of your life in sheets. Don't you think it's about time for a betting upgrade? Brooklinen is the fastest growing betting brand in the world. They've got over 30,000 five-star reviews. And as a Brooklinen customer, I can see why. These sheets keep me cool and sleeping comfortably all night long. It's hard to put a price on that, but let's talk about price. Brooklinen sheets give you that expensive feel without the astronomical price tag. That's because Brooklinen was the first betting company to work directly with manufacturers and directly with customers, no middlemen. My Brooklinen sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. And now it's time for your upgrade. Get $20 off and free shipping when you use promo code DEATH at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. The only way to get $20 off and free shipping is to use promo code DEATH at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code DEATH. Brooklinen. These really are the best sheets ever. When we talk about true crime stories, we're always interested in the mind of the criminal. What was their childhood like? What influences on them caused them to commit their crimes? What were they thinking? And how did it all go so wrong? These are the questions behind the premise of Wondery's new series, Imagined Life. The podcast asks you to imagine yourself in the shoes of world-famous people thinking their thoughts, feeling their feelings. You will confront their adversity. You will overcome their challenges. You will experience their hopes. You will try and fail and then eventually succeed to become the people they are today. Some you think you know, even admire, or maybe the opposite. But there's a twist. Only in the final moment of the show will you find out who you are. Subscribe today to Imagine Life on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now. Last month, I visited a man named Terry in the condo where he and his wife live in central Dallas. He's in his mid-50s. He'd rather I not use his last name. But in February of 2017, he sat in the jury box of one of the biggest trials in Dallas, a member of the group that convicted Christopher Dunch and sentenced him to life in prison. Terry sat second from the end. He told me he was impressed with the way the judge conducted the trial with the serious demeanor of the courtroom. Every day was businesslike. Much of the testimony was unforgettable. Dr. Henderson, for sure, Dr. Lazar, for sure, and, and Dr. Kirby. Uh, their testimony was very, very powerful. But it was the patients and their families that moved him. All of them affected us, every single one of them. Mis uh, Mr. Margoloff, Mr. Summers, everybody. I mean, you know, Mr. Passmore, everybody, that, um, Shirley Malak. There was a ton of them that came through, which was overwhelming. He remembers being most shaken by the testimony of Kelly Martin's husband. Remember, she's the patient who died at Baylor Hospital after what was supposed to be a routine outpatient procedure. I just remember noticing and observing his pain even after 
the the time this time had gone by, how much how painful it was, and how much he loved his wife, and um, you know how it was this the, these emotions really were still raw with him and losing his wife so tragically and unexpectedly. Uh, it was you know that affected me, that, and, and all the jury there there was not a dry eye in the house when we went to recess after his testimony. Everybody in the room was uh, very emotional. At the end of each day, the jurors weren't allowed to discuss what they'd heard to help process it all. There were many times after, you know, victim testimony, especially when, you know, people were pretty frazzled and pretty spent and pretty emotional. And I remember several times when we'd go back into the jury room and we'd, you know, hug each other, wipe each other's tears, you know, give each other support because we really couldn't talk about this. You know, we couldn't discuss any of the anything. You know, we could just, all we could do is, you know, support each other and say, hey, I understand how you're feeling, you know, and then, and then move on to the next day or the next testimony. And that this would happen day after day. Yeah, every day. And every day he saw Christopher Dunch on the other side of the courtroom. He seemed to have a five o'clock shadow every day, but he did, he was well-dressed. I mean, he was in a suit, um, but he... I don't recall ever seeing him look at us. Uh, I never ever caught um, locked eyes with him or and ever really noticed him looking at us. Uh, he did pay attention to uh, the witness testimony, but he was really unemotional, very unemotional. I was mainly focused on the witness myself. <laughs> Occasionally I would take a glance over there and, and see if there was a reaction from him, and there never was. In fact, the first time Terry ever heard Dunch's voice was on this podcast. It was a police interview maybe that you'd played recording of, and I was really surprised at how he was not very crisp. I, actually, I, I, I have known this was going on. I actually planned to bring all my documents to the DA directly. Oh, did you? And let him have everything. So his his voice didn't match what I had thought his, his voice would be. Because he kind of slurred his words? Yeah, and... exactly. His voice did not match to me the arrogance and ego that was presented from his patients and test his victims and testimony. After the defense rested and the jurors went off to deliberate, Terry says it was the weight of all the patients and doctors' testimony that led them to a quick verdict. One thing that mattered much less to them, even though it got so much attention outside the jury room, was the email in which Dr. Dench called himself a cold-blooded killer. I think everybody felt like that email was just another example of him being unhinged and being a narcissist and his and goes to his state of mind and the way he is. The jury needed to decide that he had criminal intent. That's what made this trial different from a civil medical malpractice trial. One factor that Terry says did make a big impact on them was all the years that Christopher Dunch had spent in his residency program and fellowship, that at least on paper, he should have been trained enough to know good surgical technique from bad. The guy was not competent, but, you know, being incompetent and then continuing to do it, continuing to hurt these people and maim these people, you know, that was the, that was it. That was the part that you know, we saw as a jury that was, that was his guilt. The jury took only four hours to come to a verdict. Operating room and all, as best as we can. In other words, the jurors believed that if Dunch were to get out of prison, he could conceivably start operating again somewhere. It was still a possibility down the road, maybe not in the U.S., but he could do that, he could, um, go to a foreign country where their credentialing may not be as strict and stringent. We just couldn't let that happen. We could not let him uh, operate on another person. After the podcast, Terry reached out to me for a simple reason. It was the first time he heard details about Dunch's appeal. He wrote me a note that said, what's most concerning other than the medical community system failure is the fact that Dunch could possibly get a new trial and be free someday to practice medicine again. This simply cannot happen. There's not a day that goes by that I do not think about all the lives that were affected by his incompetence and ego. 
One thing Dunch's appeals attorney is pushing for is to exclude mention of other surgeries besides Mary Eford's in any retrial. She argued that including the other cases made the trial unfair. The prosecutors used those cases in the original trial to establish a pattern of behavior to show that so many surgeries were botched before Mary Eford's, he had to know he would likely injure her. If it was just Mary Eford only, with uh, no reference to pattern, previous uh, behavior uh, of maiming and killing people, then the jury would just we would not see all the facts. Um, and it'd be a travesty to justice. And plus, I think it would victimize these people all over again. They've already had they've already gone through this enough. The decision of whether to offer a new trial currently rests with the three judges on the Fifth Circuit of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. And there's no knowing exactly when they'll announce their decision. It could be soon or it could be many months from now. For the past couple of months, I've heard a lot more stories about Christopher Dunch, from the people who knew him in medical school and residency to former neighbors who heard the wild parties at his house on Vance Avenue in Memphis. It seems that no one who interacted with Christopher Dunch found him easily forgettable, especially if you were the one who called him one great man. Finally, I'd like to end with an update about another patient in the podcast, Shirley Mock. I talked to her recently, and she told me she was recovering from a broken arm that she'd suffered after a fall in her home. I and the whole team from Wondery would like to wish her well in her continued recovery. Whoa, this don't take no vacation in this land. Whoa, this from Wondery, this is a special episode of Dr. Death an investigative miniseries about the system that failed to protect 33 patients in Dallas. If you'd like to help us spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. If you know of a story like Dr. Death or Dirty John that needs to be investigated, please write to us at tips at wondery.com. Dr. Death was written, reported, and hosted by me, Laura Beal. Sound designed by Jeff Schmidt. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marsha Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.